Okay, I think we'll go ahead and, and get started. This, this presentation is mostly about new embankment design. So the objectives of, of, this, of this presentation, I'm um, gonna go over design criteria, and, and I, I wanna stress from, right from the start that uh, in the core, we oftentimes will put together uh, what we call memorandums of record, MFRs, that, that uh, and I was involved with, with one project as an advisor, which is actually one of our case histories on Jadwin Dam, and there were three critical criteria for that particular project, and a lot of them have more than that, but what we, what we uh, asked the team to do is to put together MFRs for those three different criteria that control the entire design, and do that upfront early in the design process. So you could vet those out and not wait until 60 or 90%. And then, then you just attach them to your DDR, you know, your design documentation report at the end of that. And then you can just briefly explain them in the text, you know, to summarize them, but the details are, are in the MFR. So um, anyway, you should establish the design criteria early on in your project. One of the very first things you do, and again, I, I would highly recommend doing these technical memorandums, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation would call them, but to do those early on. So I'm gonna go through some uh, different embankment configurations uh, and zonation. You've seen some examples already. We're gonna go through a few more, ask you to comment on some of those. Um, describe foundation design, freeboard camber. Brian talked a lot about camber, so we're just gonna to touch on that a little bit. Upstream and downstream slope protection. A uh, little bit about the design of those and, and give you some uh, different materials that are used. Um, we're going to, again, filters and drains. Like I said, it's going to come up almost in every single presentation, it seems, uh, which are extremely critical for dam safety. We're going to talk about those. Filter compatibility, and Amanda mentioned that. We're going to go through uh, an example of that and as part of our exercise going to uh, look at tow drains and uh, trench drains and filters and actually show some details that were, have been used on final design, on, on uh, final design projects. Uh, talk about filters and, uh, and fill placement adjacent to appurtenant structures, which are outlet works and spillways, and how important that is and some placement procedures and compaction. Stream diversion, of course, would come up on, on almost every project, whether it's a coffer dam, a diversion tunnel, we're going to touch on that, and even though it's not something that's common on new embankments, I'm going to touch on overtopping protection of embankment dams. Those are, are, are usually used as an alternative for existing dams. In fact, um, I'll talk about one of the projects for the core that's ongoing right now that's going to have overtopping protection. So, so uh, factors to consider in, uh, in embankment design. Um, Cassie talked a lot about site geology and, and alignment associated with site geology. Um, and then, of course, your alignment with appurtenant structures, again, spillways and outlet works, uh, that's certainly going to come into play as far as the location of the dam. Uh, hydrology, of course, we're not going to go into any details about hydrology in, in this course, and I see there's a big sigh of relief with that. So uh, geotechs, we always try to get involved, but better left to the hydrologist. But, we, we, but the, the height of the embankment dam and really the crest of the embankment dam will depend on the spillway in combination with it. Because your, your spillway is going to be designed to pass a design storm. And you have to have an adequate amount of freeboard on top of that. So you don't have wave over, uh, overwash or you don't overtop your embankment during that design storm. So they always have to go hand in hand as far as what the crest elevation of your dam is and your spillway capacity. Uh, water retention, uh, I think somebody had uh, discussed in one of the earlier presentations about core, a lot of core dams, and, and I, I, want, I, I think I've seen this number before, there's about maybe 70 to 80% of the core dams are flood, are flood control. And a lot of our dams have never seen a loading before. You know, they're dry dams. Um, so it depends. The, one of the factors to consider is whether it's a, it's a water storage, is it a dry dam, or is it a combination of flood control and water storage? Because obviously, if it's for water supply, you have to have an adequate water supply. So you have to find a site that will store that amount of water. Uh, and actually, we have some case histories that, that describe 
uh, some of those situations. We've already talked about Amanda went over uh, static uh, stability. She talked a little bit about uh, for, for floods as well. Um, and she's going to actually talk about dynamic stability uh, tomorrow. So that would certainly be one of the factors. Embankment compression and foundation consolidation. Brian's talked about those. We touched on internal erosion, uh, the slope erosion I'm going to describe a little bit more. Economic utilization of materials. So that would be like a material balance. I think Cassie touched on that is to use locally available materials, particularly materials that are from planned excavations. If you're building a new spillway, you'd want to utilize those in your new embankment dam, certainly if at all possible. Constructability always comes into play to make sure that, that uh, what you're designing is easily constructible uh, and that also has uh, a precedence associated with that. We keep bringing that up that you should learn from, from past designs and cross sections that have been done and details, uh, and also uh, study past failures, past failure modes and incidents. Um, as we, it's, it's really the design is, is a lot about designing for the failure modes, right? The most common failure modes uh, associated with an embankment. You want to make sure you design them. Uh, and we always talk about making sure for, for a modification, you don't introduce new failure modes as well. So um, design continues through construction. So I think Cassie brought the, this up, that your big excavation, you really don't know the foundation until you open up that excavation. Design process, we always talk about a, an iterative process to, to, um, to balance the on-site borrow materials again. Uh, with the locally available materials. This really kind of went through uh, the rest of this list, but I want to talk a little bit about the uh, construction risks. I think I mentioned this yesterday. Uh, with the core, we, uh, we typically look at construction risks during the modification study, uh, as well as about halfway through the final design to make sure that our designs not only are, are uh, con constructible, but we don't introduce high construction risk during construction. So we look at the sequence of construction, and particularly one of the first things that you think about for construction risk is, is water diversion and coffer dams. So um, two of the, uh, the biggest elements, and, and we actually uh, you know, look at that from a risk standpoint to make sure we're not introducing additional risk and we don't want to increase our risk from the baseline risk that exists today during construction. That's kind of really the goal. So, and I just wanted to mention that, um, yeah, construction risks can, uh, if we create downstream uh, consequences or failure modes, and that could be, um, uh, some of those risks could be uh, associated with a winter shutdown in a cold climate. And if you, if you shut down a project, you have to make sure that you prepare the, the foundation or the top of the embankment wherever you had kind of left off and not, not introduce a potential seepage path right through your embankment. Um, and actually, we have a, a case history of a serious flaw that was left uh, Jadwin Dam, and the whole reason for the project was because of a construction flaw that was left during, during a winter shutdown period. So, so uh, some general uh, design criteria, of course, the uh, embankment, foundation, abutments, reservoir, rim, they, all, they have to be stable under all loading conditions. And uh, I think Amanda kind of touched on that. And, and the seepage flows for all the components must be filtered and collected. So we, you know, part of the design is to make sure that we have complete filtered exits on, uh, on any of those seepage paths that we have. So again, it's filters and drains. You know, we, we already discussed a camber to make sure we have an adequate camber to accommodate post-construction settlement. And um, we don't want to have a lower point on the embankment dam crest that could concentrate flow either from overwash or from overtopping. Talked about, the, I'll explain a little bit more about the uh, slope erosion and the, uh, uh, the water control structures, again, are, are uh, capable of passing the design storm uh, and then we, we, for dam design, we always talk about redundant features. And I think a second line of defense. So we always want, at any time that we possibly can, we want to put in second lines of defense. So a good example is 
If you remember the cross sections that, that Amanda and I showed yesterday, where you have a central core of the dam, and then immediately downstream of that, you, you have a, 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 a chimney filter. Then downstream of the chimney filter is a chimney drain. So you have a sand and then a uniform stone. So if, you, if, your, if, your, filter, if your filter cracks, so you have a crack in your abandonment and your filter cracks, then you have that drain immediately downstream. If you have enough flow that goes through your system because of a flaw through the embankment and your filter it doesn't have the capacity to handle that flow, you have the drain immediately downstream of that to then handle that capacity of the, of the flow. And, and again, a flaw, and I've seen this in an embankment before, that if the borrow material isn't mixed properly coming out of the borrow or you're not paying attention and they put a more sort of sandy layer and they're put building this thing horizontally, you can see embankments that actually have like a green strip at a certain elevation on the downstream slope that is below the pool level. That's a, certainly, anytime you see green vegetation, except for the grass that's supposed to be green, um, but anything that's more woody vegetation at a certain elevation, that, that probably is an indication that you may have a, a, a fine layer that is more of a sandy layer through your embankment and you're getting seepage flow through that. And that's, that may have been caused by, again, the borrow not being properly mixed when you, uh, when you built your embankment to begin with. So I just I mentioned this several times, but again, uh, the material balance on a project is extremely critical. And David Serafini is going to talk about Lake Isabella Dam that had two and a half million yards of rock excavation for, for Isabella Dam. It was more of a granitic, and they process all the materials on site. So it was a huge material balance for the entire project. So all the drain material, all the filter sand, and all the concrete for the project all came out of the rock excavation for that project. So uh, I, I don't think it can be emphasized enough that you really have to look at the material balance really virtually on every single project that involves an earthwork project. So I, I think we've, we've kind of covered these somewhat, but uh, what are the types of embankment dams? Well, there's homogenous dams, uh, the zoned, zoned earth fill, and then we have a combination sometimes of earth fill and rock fill. Uh, we've talked about central cores and sloping cores. And also, uh, there's different facings on, on, on dams as well. There's concrete and asphalt faced. Um, not very often that there's buried geomembranes, but we put that in there because they have occurred. And we actually have uh, central asphalt cores as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit, little bit more. And, and, and again, the geomembranes. I've seen a couple of projects that have actually had an internal geomembrane, but those are a bit more unusual, so. Uh, so selection of the type of dam, again, it depends on the locally available material. We talked about the uh, topography, geology uh, quite a bit um, with, uh, with, with Cassie. And uh, I, I wanted to, one point I wanted to emphasize, I think Cassie had brought this up, that the foundation for a concrete dam, so for a, uh, a, a, um, a, a stiff element dam, I guess I should say, whether it's a concrete gravity dam or arch dam, has to be a very firm foundation. It really has to go on rock. You don't want to put a concrete dam on something that's compressible because it's going to crack the dam. But for an embankment dam, you're spreading the load out over a much wider footprint. It doesn't mean that you're not going to uh, uh, put in, in, your found, in, in your design, you're not going to include, you are going to include elements to shape your foundation and whatnot to reduce differential settlement of sort of the cracking potential. But you, you don't, I don't know if I've ever seen a case that we've put, put a concrete dam on, on a soil foundation. I think that's pretty much unheard of. So um, just wanted to kind of emphasize that point that you don't want to have it on a compressible foundation. Uh, climate, um, Cassie touched on this as well, but I, I, I know one project, uh, southwestern part of the state, Texas, um, where 
the excavation for the spillway when the dam was built, I think in the 1950s, that was all a, a clay shale. So it, it broke down into more like a very high plastic clay, a CH material. So they, they placed the entire embankment. Um, the, the project about maybe eight years ago went through about a seven year drought period. So there was desiccation cracks that were very deep on the upstream shoulder of the embankment because it's CH and they weren't really detected. And then, it, of course, what happened to come out of that drought was the pool of record for the, for the dam. So it had a tremendous rainstorm, filled those cracks with water, um, and then created an upstream slope stability within the embankment. So at least it wasn't into the foundation. Um, it still, it could have progressed into something much worse if it wasn't taken care of, but it, it wasn't an immediate threat to the dam. Um, in that case, what they ended up doing, and Texas uses this a lot, the, the uh, Texas uh, DOT, they use lime to stabilize. And Brian Dillard touched on that to use lime, um, which, will, uh, which will help prevent the infiltration of water you know, into that and, and actually reduce the desiccation potential to, to crack. So they kind of entombed that, that CH material kind of around the, uh, the, the dam crest and on the upstream and downstream slopes with lime stabilized materials. So that's how they, they got around that as just kind of a side note. So um, type of dam based on, uh, well, client preference. The clients may have a preference on the type of operation and maintenance they do. They may have uh, certain capabilities. They may not want to mow their downstream slope, so you put rock on it instead. If you've got excess rock from your excavation, uh, that sort of thing, um, and available construction resources. So when you're designing a new dam, it, it, it's better not to use specialty uh, construction methods, a slurry cutoff wall, uh, whatever, it, unless you have to for the design. So you want to use more standard methods that are locally available for construction to be more economical. And of course, economics um, obviously would, would uh, come into play here as well. So the, the, the alignment of, of uh, embankment dam, um, certainly one of the factors is obviously to minimize the volume of your embankment. The, the least, least amount of fill would cost you less. We talked about the geology and topography, but also, again, associated with where the appurtenant structures are, are going to be located. So in terms of does the embankment butt up against the spillway wall or is the spillway off on a reservoir rim someplace? And the same uh, uh, with powerhouses, uh, with outlet works. If you have a tunnel, you have to just uh, configure your embankment in association with those features as well. And we've talked a little bit and just kind of changing courses and just to make sure we're all on the same page and have an understanding when we talk about uh, top of active storage, maximum high pool and whatnot. So some of the terms that we sometimes kick around, I thought it'd be good just to, to, to touch base on it at this point. So from the, from the bottom of the reservoir pool up to the invert of the low level outlet, that's usually considered to be dead storage, right? If it was water supply, you wouldn't be able to, to, to get that water unless you pumped it out. So then sort of the normal storage, normal pool, or sometimes called conservation pool, goes from that level uh, up, to, up to what's called the uh, normal storage, up to where the sort of pool is typically maintained. And that may be the pool level that is maintained for, say, water supply. And then from there, it's the flood storage, which goes up to the top of active uh, storage, which is the spillway crest. And above that is the freeboard, goes up to the maximum high pool level. So just want to make sure that when these terms kind of came, come up in the future that we're all on the same page. So um, I, I think I mentioned Ed, Ed Friend from the uh, RMC is going to talk, has a, I don't know, 45 minute presentation about foundation design, I believe tomorrow. So um, I wanted to just touch base on it. Like I said, I'm, I'm trying to go through kind of briefly some of the longer presentations, but to kind of show you the sort of sequence and what it takes to do a new embankment design. So this was actually a project that is a non-core project that I was involved with just fairly recently. We did a semi-quantitative risk assessment on this dam. Um, and this actually was built in the early 1950s, but 
but the, the issue was that we had some very loose deposits, blow counts of about five to eight, that were um, silty sands mainly, but it had organic sim in, in them as well, um, and fairly, fairly deep, um, deep deposits here as well. So you can, see, you can see from the ground surface, so I can use my pointer here. <laughs> Okay, so from uh, from the ground surface up, it was you know somewhere on the order of about maybe seventy feet thick or so of this loose deposit. And the designers back then recognized that they could have long term settlement, and this was in a very high seismic area as well. So they could have issues uh, with liquefaction, and uh, and right below that was another. So that was an upper alluvial layer. Right below that was another alluvial layer that was much denser. So blow counts 11 to 34. That wasn't felt to have uh, liquefaction potential. So they excavated this whole area out and basically founded the dam on this um, on on compacted fill, which was core material. So that kind of served as a little bit of a cutoff. But mainly, it was done to make sure we didn't have uh, they didn't have differential settlement of this dam. Ed's going to go through a lot more of this. I know these are a lot of details on the left, but again, I, I think we're trying to sprinkle through this enough to give you a feel of the level of detail that a final design project requires. So it's all in the details, and uh, that's what it should be. But there's a so Ed will go over this a lot more. But this is basically a forming in a in a rock foundation is uh, is is prepping the uh, and shaping the foundation and then filling areas that are discontinuities in the rock and shear zones with some sort of a grout, a cementitious material, uh, and not allowing kind of the, the typical maximum slope that you, wanna, you, you don't want to exceed to limit your differential settlement is about a half horizontal to one vertical, is about as steep as you want. So you cut those slopes back, um, and you prep any other slopes. If you have overhangs, you take those out. So it's that kind of foundation preparation. Now, now these photos, just to give you an idea of, of the level of effort that it takes, these photos came from Lake Isabella Dam, um, which was a, which is a raise, a 16 foot raise in an existing embankment dam. But you can see how many laborers there are out here that are, are working to, uh, to clean up this foundation. Um, really, the first thing is to, is to, get, is to map it uh, and, and then to prep the foundation as well. So in this case, they're actually placing a, a, a filter. So this is, this is in the downstream area, they're placing a filter. Uh, but you'd have to have extreme scrutiny as well if this was where the core of the dam was going to sit for a new dam and you had this rock foundation. So you had to have a proper preparation before you would place any material back either in the uh, downstream area or particularly even almost really more importantly is at the core contact. So at this point, I'm going to walk through, kind of from upstream to downstream, I'm going to walk through some of the important dam features that are uh, for, for an embankment dam design. I'm going to start with the wave run-up on the upstream slope and, and protection um, of, that, of that upstream slope from wave action. I'm going to look at some uh, details of the dam crest. We're going to go through uh, water barriers, Again, the core of the dam and, and seepage reduction elements that we talked yesterday. I had seepage reduction and seepage control elements. A um, little bit about stability with the shells, um, seepage collection uh, systems, as well as downstream slope protection. So here's kind of a, a simple sketch of, a, of, a, um, of an upstream slope. And typically upstream slopes, you'd have uh, riprap protection, and underneath that would be a bedding material. So typically you have a two-layer system. So the bedding protects uh, from wave action, protects the, the fines, whether it's your shell or your core right here. If, if you didn't have that bedding, it could really be drawn right out through those larger voids in the riprap. I've actually seen this. On a, on a core dam that you had a whole pile of fines at the at near the downstream upstream toe 
because you know the reservoir fluctuated a little bit and you kind of walk along and said geez there's all this fine material right here well it may have been that the bedding was not properly sized to filter from that wave action to really draw out those fines um, but but here for, for this particular I, I just want to I'm not going to go through details on how to design this there's a lot of uh, standards out there and, and how to um, determine the size of riprap and and, and saying that you first would design your riprap based on a lot of different factors. I'll go over those in a second. Then you would design your bedding to be compatible with your riprap. And then you look at the filter compatibility of your bedding versus whatever is immediately downstream of it. And I'm going to go over a case in a second where I actually had to put a third layer in there because of the fine grain nature of that, of that say, shell or core material adjacent. But that... Um, the, the the wave setup that is shown here is, is really a uh, uh, wind stresses that are that are, are across a still water that kind of pile up the water right next to the the dam itself the embankment dam to slightly raise that that water surface so the freeboard that we're talking about is a combination of the wave setup plus that that wave run up on the upstream slope mentioned that that uh, term freeboard earlier so so the upstream slope um, based on several factors um, the first factor um, really is the fetch or that's the the distance across the uh, the water surface from the shoreline where it hits the hits the dam itself um, and then it also depends of course uh, on wind velocity and it's, it, it, you'll, you'll end the duration of wind. And there's, some, there's, uh, there's, there's charts to go through based on the location across the country that'll show uh, wind velocities at like 50, uh, uh, 50 year return periods and 100 year return periods. Um, the reservoir topography and the, and the pitch of the upstream slope all are factors that have to go into a de determination of how much wave run up which will then be used to then determine the size of, of your riprap required. So variety of upstream slope protection, of course, one of the more popular, I think, and uh, usually readily available is just quarried rock. Uh, cobbles and boulders have been used, to go, again, if they're locally available. Now, if, if there's not a good source of rock available on the site, um, soil cement has been used on the upstream slope. In fact, there's one right in the Denver area of soil cement that's a little bit east of Denver, but it was far enough away and it was enough material they decided it was more economical to put soil cement in. Concrete, asphalt concrete and steel. Um, there's one steel face dam that I'm aware of in Colorado. That's the only one I've ever heard of. I don't know if there's another in the U.S., but that's a little bit unusual. But um, Colorado Springs Utilities, I think, uh, owns that steel face dam. Maybe they wish they didn't, but it, uh, that was what was at least determined at the time it was built to be maybe a more economical material. And again, upstream slope protection depends on the local uh, available material and then O&M considerations as well. So like with a soil cement or your steel face uh, or concrete you know, on it, you know, you have to have joints on the upstream slope and that could cause some issues associated with long-term maintenance. This is just a kind of a typical uh, riprap slope. This is an older photo from Wapapello Dam, a core dam, um, and during placement, they had a, a fine filter, kind of hard to see in the picture, but there is a filter underneath this. So I mentioned a three filter system, and I just wanted to kind of show you Show you a photo uh, again from from Lake Isabella Dam. We keep talking about that, but it's a it's a long it's a large project, almost near the completion. So we had just some really good recent photos from it. So you so you notice that here's the riprap, and this was all sized, uh, you know, a lot to do with the velocity, the wind speed, duration, and the fetch. So you can see that's some pretty large rock right there. So the bedding material, of course, was filter compatible with that. But then another filter was added on the downstream side again because it had to be compatible with the material directly underneath that.
I talked about soil cement. Here's kind of a little sketch of, of, of soil cement. When it's placed, it's usually placed, it, it, typically it's placed in, in horizontal lifts, um, equipment width for the, for the benches. So these are on the order of about seven to probably closer to 10 feet wide. So you can get a dozer and a compactor, and usually these are gonna be compacted. If people are familiar with roller compacted concrete, it's compacted similar to that. It's gonna be compacted with a smooth run roller uh, as it goes up, and you can see the kind of the nominal thickness is in the order of two to two and a half feet. Um, there is another, whoops, let me just go. There we go. So a little bit of an older photo, but you get the idea of the placement and the horizontal lifts going up. You have a little little bench, of course, that, that, that uh, goes up, up the face. But there's another method that's called plating, and that's where you'd place it, you'd place it parallel with the slope. So instead of having steps, it would be placed in this direction here, up and down the slope, um, usually in about six to 12 inch uh, lifts. Um, that, that would be perpendicular to that slope. And a little bit of an issue with that is the bond between those lifts are extremely critical because if you don't have good bond, you could just have that failure surface right in between the lifts. So I think this is, is probably a bit more of a, of a common method, but I've seen the other method used as well, the plating method. Uh, and then it's a trade-off between um, um, putting in a, a, a somewhat thicker lift or doing a, additional lifts. If you need a really thick lift for protection, you, prob you have to uh, include in your construction documents, in your specs, that they have to treat that as a construction joint, those lifts in between. So you have to go out and, and spray high pressure water on it to expose the aggregate so you have a good bond between uh, the upper and the lower lift. And this is just a, of photos of a couple of dams in Colorado, Montgomery Dam and uh, Upper Blue River Dam. They're not core dams, but um, that picture is actually at the right orientation. It's not like you have to tilt it, you know, so they're, they're paving up and down the upstream slope of the dam that you can see is, is pretty quick. It's a, it's a different mix. It's not the mix that you'd put on a highway. Um, the asphalt is, is different as far as the, the, the liquid asphalt and whatnot, but, um, these actually were, are placed in, in a cold climate. And of course, that, that's a little bit problematic as far as cracking. But again, this is an area that they decided to, it, was, it was more cost effective for a variety of reasons, I guess, to put in a, a uh, asphalt face. Um, I'm now gonna walk through the dam crest. We're gonna look at design considerations with drainage, camber, surfacing, public safety, and, and zoning. Okay, so for, for the width, it, it really depends on what the roadway is gonna be used for, whether it's public access or, or just from an O&M standpoint, um, as far as how wide it needs to be. Uh, the SEPA's length uh, at normal pool and above, we, we also control that width. Um, if you're sometimes, I've worked on some embankments that have a, that is a phased approach for like a water supply. So they're gonna build it in say two phases. They're gonna build it up to a certain elevation because of funding, perhaps. And then some years later, depending on water demand, they're gonna raise that dam. So if they're gonna raise it, and you know it's gonna raise, you wanna configure your existing dam to be able to tie into your filters and core to be able to easily raise the dam. Wide enough for future access and maintenance. I worked on a dam in Colorado that was well, a couple of thousand feet long, and there was a spillway off on the right abutment uh, but there was no like bridge, there was no reason to put a bridge across the spillway abutment. There wasn't anything over there to access to, but we put a little bulb at the end on the right abutment, right adjacent to the spillway wall. So you wouldn't have to like back out 2000 feet to, you know, as O&M comes in, they can just turn around that bulb and, and go back out. Um, and then some state reg regulations require a certain minimum crest width. So I know the state of Colorado is one, depending on the height of the dam, will set minimum widths. I think it goes up to 25 feet wide. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't allow something bigger than that, but depending on the height, uh, it goes up to 25 feet. Okay, um, drainage. So usually 
we've talked about the upstream slope being protected with riprap. Typically, you would, you would pitch your crest about 1% to 2% towards the upstream side, so your, your flow, your overland flow, is going onto your protected slope. And there may be rare cases where you have a, a highway that has to be crowned or whatever, but you typically want to dump it on the upstream side, uh, again, where it's, where it's protected. So, uh, uh, Surfacing of the dam crest. So again, a, a hardened surface to protect it from rutting, a wave over wash, wash depending on what kind of traffic uh, and, and maintenance access you have to have. A lot of core dams, at least I've been involved with, are paved. Because there's enough O and M activity out there, uh, particularly um, uh, you know to get out for 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 maintenance maybe of a gate or a spillway. Um, a lot of low hazard dams. I've been involved with quite a few low hazard dams over the years, and a lot of those have aggregate base core surface. So it's something to avoid rutting on the dam surface. And again, you would pitch those on the upstream side. Uh, public safety. If it's a road that's being used by the general public, it usually would have to put guide rails, guard rails on the upstream and downstream shoulders. And of course, after 9-11, there was a, a big uh, push to, to try to limit the, the people that could actually ac access to a dam, particularly across the dam crest, so uh, from a security standpoint. So if that, if that can be done, and a lot of core dams are that way. You just, you're, they're gated, you can't, you can't have access across the top of them. So zonation, top of the core, um, at or above that maximum protected uh, reservoir pool is what is uh, typically suggested. And to extend that chimney drain to the top of the core, if at all possible, you have to have a, a minimum amount of cover, of course, over that. But, um, but uh, that's the standard is to, is to raise that chimney up um, if you can have that associated with the core. And uh, we talked about camber a bit. Um, this actually came from a final design project. And, and uh, one thing I, I just want to note is that usually when you show, the camber is shown for a reason, both with and without camber. When you have a design, that is the design standard. So at some point in time in the future, that somebody can, can take a look at that and know how much camber that you actually included in the design. If you didn't put this on, so the contractor is going to build it to the, the, uh, the, the cross-section with camber. Right, so the contractor really could care less. I don't know what the heck this other, these other numbers are even there for, but it's really for the designers. So the, another designer that comes in later, or a risk assessment standpoint, they know how much settlement was accounted for, or how much was predicted anyway, based on the camber. So, and I'm not really going to spend more time about this. This is just a simple profile in the cross section, and Brian went over this in detail. And then the only reason I brought this up again is the level of detail for final design. Uh, here, you have, you have a, a profile across the dam crust. You want to show the station and elevation of, uh, of where your camber tapers, so that you have no camber, where it builds up the full camber. So there's a, a clear understanding from the contractor standpoint, uh, as well as uh, uh, this figure. I think Brian may have used this one as well. But you can see the level of detail that a final design takes in order to construct it properly, um, you need this, this level of detail. So, Just kind of walking through, again, I'm going from upstream to downstream. Hopefully you can stay with me here. But I wanted to go through the different water barriers. Of course, there's a, uh, the central core. Get this to work. Uh, asphalt cores. Um, I'm going to go through this a, a bit more, but they're typically much thinner than, than a, 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 a larger a central core for, say, a clay core dam. Oop. Have that sloping core we've talked about a little bit. Amanda just went through some of the reasons, maybe not why you put it in a new dam, went through the uh, uh, asphaltic, concrete, or cement base. So um, I, I, I put this slide up yesterday. And I wanted to, again, emphasize seepage reduction and seepage control features for a typical embankment section. And, and these are kind of the standard measures that are used for any embankment. So um, just wanted to reemphasize that. You would start with, with these points because they're proven. They've worked before. They have historic uh, precedents. They have good performance history. Um, 
Now I'm, I'm going to switch a, a little bit to a couple of uh, uh, some typical cross sections. Uh, one where we have a, uh, uh, an embankment that is on a, a, uh, a soil foundation and one that's on rock. And, and you can see we've, uh, we've talked about the, the chimney filters and drains and the blanket filters and drains. And, and one thing to note on this particular cross section, depending on the gradation of your shell material, you may need... So this is showing a three-layer system. You put a sand blanket and then a drain material, so a stone, uh, like a half-inch uh, uh, passing stone here. And then you may need to have a, a filter on top of that, depending on the gradation of your, of your uh, shell material. And not shown here, but there may be some consideration about adding another filter here, again, depending on that, that shell material um, gradation. So on, on rock, you have a similar configuration, but here it's, it's showing blanket grouting. And oftentimes, particularly with a, with a pool that is, that is maintained for, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, what purpose does that shell material um, have in? Yep, the shell material? Yeah. So the, the, uh, you may recall from uh, Amanda talking about it, the shell material really is to help, is help provide support for that clay core. So the clay is, is relatively impervious. I'm calling it a clay core, but you know, a relatively impervious material will have low permeability, but it won't have high strength. So if you had the whole thing out of clay, you may have issues associated with stability. So that really helps increase stability because you have a lot higher strength of that shell upstream and downstream. So it's a good question. So oftentimes you'll use uh, grouting underneath a rock foundation to limit the amount of seepage underneath your embankment. And part of that is for, for water supply purposes. Now I included this little sketch at the bottom. This was touched on by Amanda a little bit. Um, the, the core criteria is to, uh, uh, the minimum core width would be one quarter of the, the, the maximum difference between your maximum pool and your uh, uh, minimum tailwater elevation. So the, that the base of the core, that would be one quarter of that. Um, and then the top width would be a minimum of 10 feet. So again, these are, these are minimum widths. It really depends particularly on what type of material that is. If you have a more silty core versus a clayey core. And in literature, if you looked, that, that width may range from about 25% about to say 60%. And again, really depending on the permeability of that material. So why does a core slope upstream? Well, as the in this particular embankment configuration, you remember that you could use either a, a, a core, a central core that has slopes upstream and downstream on that central core, or you could use a, uh, a, a, a vertical chimney. So the designer's preference was to use a, a, a vertical chimney instead so, um, so as, a, as the head increases, you need to have the, the core increase as well, right? So why was all the alluvium removed? You can see it was on a, uh, on a base of, uh, of alluvial material. Uh, and it was more likely it was due to liquefaction and potentially due to seepage issues as well. Uh, why is the blanket on top of rock? Well, it was to protect that rock from uh, internal erosion. Um, and anybody, why would you angle grout holes underneath an embankment like this? Any, anybody venture a guess? Intersect uh, joints that are, are uh, different orientations. So if you had, a, had, had joint sets that were very steeply uh, dipping and you drilled it vertical, you wouldn't intersect many of those joints. So you'd want to angle those in association with what your bedding planes are. Um, so it's not too uncommon uh, on, uh, on projects to almost have like cross grouting as well in two different directions. So to make sure you maximize your, your grout uh, in, in terms of trying to make that uh, foundation as impervious as possible. So rock filled dams, the this, this central sloping cores and, and upstream barriers as well on rock fill dams. I think we, we touched on that a bit. And 
Really, Rockville dams became more popular in the 1960s. There was a lot of them that started to be built because they had a large, so why would you use a Rockville dam instead? Well, there's large quantities of rock that were gonna be produced, say, from excavating for a new spillway. So you had all that rock available. In fact, we go to Lake Isabella Dam and all the rock for the spillway, that's why the downstream raised material in the shell was made out of rock fill. If it would have been a huge soil cut for Isabella, they would have used a soil material in the downstream shell. So they used the material that was locally available. Um, if also rock fill dams, if there isn't earth fill that is either locally available or take a lot of processing and had a lot of oversized material, then they may consider rock fill as well uh, as an option. So this is just an example of a really concrete face rock fill dam. You see that there's this filter material uh, immediately downstream uh, of, of that uh, upstream face barrier. And then the, the rock fill gradation gets larger as you go downstream. That's for compatibility, filter compatibility, as well as provide strength uh, for stability. Um, here's another example of a core dam, uh, a Caesar Creek dam, um, central, central core. And um, uh, I think that the issues, you know, you see that there is, there's a chimney drain, there's a blanket drain on the foundation. We have a cutoff. And, and one other aspect of this particular design is that uh, the, the, this upstream area, going to come over and point this laser is not working here, but these, these two zones here were actually stage one and stage two of construction that served as a coffer dam. So they built these early on, and then they can build the rest of the embankment with the coffer dam protection and some kind of diversion around this as well. So you kind of, if you blow it up, you'll, you'll see it says uh, uh, phase one and phase two, I think there. Interior barriers, I want to just touch on uh, asphaltic concrete cores. Um, this is a dam in Austria that was, um, that was about uh, almost 500 feet high. Uh, but, the, but the core, because it's incredibly low permeability, the asphalt core is only on the order of about four or five feet thick um, because it's extremely low permeability. And why would you use an asphalt core dam? Well, they didn't have a clay source that was nearby. So um, there's actually a, an asphalt core dam being constructed as we speak in, in Colorado. It's one of the rare ones. There is about 150 asphalt core dams, a little bit more than that across the world, uh, but they are becoming slightly more popular. And you notice they have filters on the upstream and downstream of that asphalt core in case you do get cracking. So you still need that protection. And, and here is the uh, compaction. As this is bring, being brought up, the filters and the core, so you can see the asphalt core here, these, uh, these filters are being placed at the same time. And I don't know, Austria has different, uh, I guess, uh, safety regulations in terms of uh, gear to wear. I don't know, knickers, I guess, maybe are safety gear in Austria. I don't know, but well, maybe a little bit of a dated photo, but you get the idea that uh, I, I guess safety doesn't always rule. So um, internal geomembranes, uh, I'm aware Reclamation actually designed a few for the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, more lower hazard dams, but they're not uh, too typically used. We usually use more standard methods, uh, particularly like with, uh, with a central core dam. Downstream slope protection, um, gravel cobbles, oftentimes grass lined, uh, berms and drainage ditches, sometimes on the groins of the dam. So uh, on the abutments, you can get concentrated flow off the abutment, so sometimes you'll put drainage ditches in there and maybe rock line those ditches. Um, erosion control mat is oftentimes used, and sometimes on really high dams, you put benches in as well to help control the, the velocity. And here's just some photographs of some core dams uh, that have a variety of, uh, of um, slope protection from, from just rock, from uh, vegetative cover. You don't want to have woody vegetation, of course, on your embankment or near your toe. Uh, one with a rock fill toe, and, and the one in the lower part is Lake Isabella as the, as the uh, rock fill is on the downstream side. Now for, for filters and drains, we, we, um, two, two major components of filters and drains is particle movement and permeability or drainage. 
So we always talk in terms of uh, two-stage filters are, uh, are what the, really the, the design standard is today. So that, again, that first function of the filter is to, is to provide, is to prevent particle movement of the core. Uh, and then the drain material is to collect that seepage through that filter and then safely uh, collect it and then measure it. So that, that the, the left um, image shows right adjacent to the core and the right image is a, a tow drain system that you'd have uh, a similar configuration. And with, with a two-stage filter, you can then open up your slots of your pipe your, or your perforations to be much more effective for drainage um, as opposed to putting sand right against your uh, drainage pipe. Now, this is a, this is a, a, a cross-section of Lake Isabella Dam, and there was a really a, a, a short section that was a new embankment uh, at Lake Isabella Dam. Uh, there's two embankments adjacent to each other, the auxiliary dam. I wanted to point out on the upstream side, there is a, there's a core cutoff here. This is all clay core, upstream slope. Uh, and then, of course, we went to a, a sand filter, a 12-foot wide a chimney, and then a 5-foot wide drain, and then a 12-foot wide transition, and then the rock fill. And the reason that, particularly that filter is 12 feet wide, is that this is in a high seismic zone. So to account for displacement during a seismic event, you want to try to maintain filter compatibility within those zones. So that's, that's for some of the reason why it was so wide. And I think David's going to go over more details about that in his presentation. So um, how about uh, the placement compaction of both core and filter drain material? So in the upper left photo, looks like there's a a tamping foot compactor compacting clay core. And these, all of these photos came from Lake Isabella. Again, we had some recent photos. Uh, the one on the upper right actually shows a disc working the material on the core. Um, we're going to talk about this a lot more in construction considerations, but you, you basically, you want to blend that material off from the dam as much as possible. But for some reason, they had to rework it on the core. But you have a large disc to, to homogenize the material and get the moisture content to be somewhat much more equal uh, as well. Lower right actually shows the same kind of process, but this is as the dam was coming up and you, you have a much narrower core as you're approaching the top and you can't get that big disc up there anymore. So you use like ripper teeth instead if you needed to uh, uh, homogenize and, and integrate the moisture in. And that lower left photo is placement of, uh, looks like drain, drain rock. Again, that's a half inch minus stone um, is some of the placement methods. And, and you kind of notice a, uh, there, isn't, there isn't like mud or anything on these wheels. That, you know, have to really be careful of that for contamination from your adjacent core material. So, so protective filters, they, they function to, uh, again, protect, protect the base material, whether it's the embankment or foundation, and from migrating into adjacent zones, uh, and to control the uh, pore pressures within the embankment. Um, typically, graded materials uh, with several different stages. Um, and uh, those protected filters are usually chimney blankets, downstream transition zones. So, so here, I'm just going through, I've, I've, I've described filters and, and drains in other scenarios, but I, I'm just really kind of looking at what their really function is. So there's nothing different than I'm going over here, except for all the filters and drains uh, provide a, a certain function here. So I'm talking about the filter like adjacent to the core or right on the foundation. So chimney, blanket filters, and then the downstream transition zones, uh, like at Lake Isabella. You had the stone that transitioned in the rock fill. That transition ends up being a protective filter for for the upstream zone adjacent to it, which is the stone, which is that drain stone. Another function is, is uh, it acts as a drain material. Uh, again, that stone that is adjacent to the filter, on, on say adjacent to the core, uh, that, is to, that function is to intercept that, uh, that seepage that comes through the filter and carry that safely away. Um, and also to prevent particle movement and drainage and not only for the chimney, but associated with, with tow drains. And that kind of ties into that two-stage system that I was talking about earlier. 
There's also what's called choke filters. Um, prevents the base material from migrating into a more pervious or say open work gravel formation. Um, not really any permeability requirements, but the one, one good example is if you had, I remember yesterday I was talking about upstream blankets. If you had an upstream blanket, say that was more of a clay material, uh, and then right below it was an open work gravel, you'd want to put a transition material in between the two so those clay fines won't migrate right into your gravel. And there's also crack, crack, uh, seismic crack stoppers that function to, to, uh, to plug cracks uh, during a seismic load. Um, and it, it's, uh, they're supposed to be sufficiently free of fines so that they can they be transported into a crack um, if you get a, a seismic event that actually cracks your embankment. So I'm gonna, gonna quickly go through um, filter uh, design. Um, uh, characterize, you first start off with characterizing the base material. Uh, and the base material is always material that is being protected from being eroded. Uh, and then, then we, we talk in terms of the filter being downstream of that. So uh, for new dam design, there's federal standards uh, to follow. And uh, Adam had brought this up earlier, some discussion about Foster and Fell criteria, which is to evaluate existing filters. So a lot of different standards out there that can be followed, um, particularly that first one, the, the FEMA guidelines is one of the more comprehensive documents out there. It's, it's free down, to be downloaded. So I highly encourage you kind of add that to your library, filters for embankment dams. There's a lot of good information in there. We're actually been working on the update of uh, EM 1901 for the core. Um, it's in uh, technical editing now, so maybe, maybe it'd be six months. I don't know, kind of hard to tell, but. Um, but the, the word should be spread uh, through headquarters that that would be available. So it's a, it's a major update to that document. So I'm going to, let me first ask, how many people have done uh, filter compatibility analysis here? You can just kind of let me know some. So it looks like quite a few people have. So I'm, I'm going to walk through this pretty quickly um, to, to, to get us on track here. So. There's nine steps that are typically re, uh, required to go through filter compatibility analysis. Uh, the core NRCS, as well as reclamation, follow the same kind of general steps. Um, you gather base soil gradations. You have to select a representative soil uh, to then do a filter compatibility analysis on. And this is to design a, a new filter, this whole process, right? To get the gradation correct for the new filter. Um, and for the drain material as well. Um, regrade that base soil if necessary. Uh, select the base material category. Particle retention in the hydraulic conductivity or drainage, are the next two steps. We go into uh, checking if it's gap graded, that is the filter. Uh, go through, uh, we, we set the limits of the fines content and oversized material, and we finally select the final gradation. So here we started out with Oftentimes we'll have a lot more gradations, but this is just for an example purposes. Um, we have a, a base material. This is probably some kind of alluvial deposit because you have a pretty wide range of gradations here to start with. So, um, you, you're, so you first, you have to go out and sample your, your material and uh, you want to sample it to where your filters are located. So if they're adjacent to the foundation, you want to sample those materials that it's protecting. Um, for a new embankment, you may be able to even dig test pits or something because it's not there at that point. You don't want to really be digging test pits at your existing dam to evaluate it. Wouldn't be recommended. Um, so the next step in the process is to select a, a, a single gradation curve. Um, you have to use some judgment. In, in this case, it kind of shows an outlier here, but you have to be kind of careful. Um, one thing you don't want to do is create too fine a filter and to actually plug drainage systems out there to limit drainage, which you can then cause uh, additional ex excess pore pressures you hadn't seen before. So it's, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Uh, sometimes it's obvious and maybe it could be sampling errors that, that uh, um, it wasn't really a representative sample, but you have to, you have to select one gradation uh, to, uh, to start with. And then the, the third step is that you, um, 
you, you, you take a look at if the material has, a, a, if your base material has a, a oversize above the number four sieve. And if it does, you, you have to just correct it. So uh, correct it so it's 100% passing. And, and simply mathematically correct it to do that. You just, you take 100 divided by your percent passing, you come up with this adjustment factor of 1.55, you multiply that by the percent passing, and you go down the board and you just, uh, you correct uh, that gradation based on that. Okay, so the, the next step, um, you come into step four, you de determine your base category. And for the, for the example I showed you before, it was slightly more, it was like 40.1%. So it's category two. Step five is you look at particle retention and you pick your, your base category. In this case, it's two, so the maximum uh, D15 of the filter would be less than or equal to, to 0.7 millimeters. And, it's, and less is dispersive, and, and Brian talked about how to determine if that base material is dispersive. Um, so that's actually a point A of, of 11 points that's gonna show up on your gradation curve to set your boundaries, your fine and coarse uh, grain boundaries for your filter. Then you go into, again, the, the hydraulic conductivity requirements or the drainage requirements. Um, uh, the, the, the based on D15 of the base, and that's the base before you regrade. So if, if I went back a couple of slides, remember I, I started out with the, the, the first slide that shows just this base gradation. So keep your eye on, on uh, curve number three. And then when I regrade, curve number three was in blue, and that's the one I select as being the, the one I'm gonna use through the rest of the analysis, except for I go back to, to, to sample three before regrading to do this, this step here. So the D15 of the base would come from that, that blue curve or, or sample number three. Um, it's between uh, three to five times, uh, times uh, D15 of the base, but not less than point, point 0.1. So that would, that would determine uh, this point B on the curve. And we've talked about this uh, step seven to prevent uh, gap grading. It's probably easier to show you on the slide because what I'm gonna do is just show you the compilation, the table of all the points and how they were determined. And I'll show you the gradation curve. So that sliding bar at any particular gradation, that sliding bar is a horizontal bar that, that between the maximum size and the minimum size, there can't be a difference of more than five times. So if you took that minimum size and multiply that by five, it has to stay within that bounds. Uh, so it, you don't create gap grading that way. And then we set, step eight is to set the, uh, the limit of the, of, the, of the fines. And typically for a filter, compacted in place filter, a 5% pass in a 200 is, uh, is the maximum and uses the maximum size for, for the filter sand is two inch. And as you go downstream for larger, that, that maximum size uh, can increase as well. And then uh, to prevent segregation, you also on kind of the limits of your gradation curve, you set the D10 and D90 of your filter. So again, you, you don't, uh, you, you avoid the segregation. So I included this slide just so you can see where each step came from and, and how you calculated it for this particular example. And now you take all 11 points, uh, including your sliding bar in here, and you can see uh, the band, uh, the band would be here and here uh, based, on, um, based on this gradation. But the gradation curve that you see in the center is the C33 sand we keep talking about. So that's actually concrete sand with a slight adjustment for the percent passing the 200 as being no more than 5%. So you want to you want to select a material that's, that's uh, readily available. And, um, and certainly concrete sand is, is, uh, is a good one that usually works in most cases. So, but you always have to check your filter compatibility anyway. Just don't go to C33 sand. I have seen one case I'm aware of that had to actually be use a, a masonry sand instead because of the category. I think it was a category one material and um, it was a little bit unique. So Foster and Fell criteria is 
And uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. It's a, it's a good method to use to evaluate existing filters. And um, it uses the fines content, this table up on the left, to then determine, uh, based on equations, whether it's a, a, a no erosion, excessive erosion, or continuing erosion. And this, this example just shows a band of a base material and what you have for an existing filter. And then it plots out on those, on those boundaries of uh, those erosion conditions. So natural and process filters. So there's a lot of existing dams that uh, they use the material that was on site, processed, probably didn't really process that, and certainly didn't process it to what uh, current standards are in terms of filter compatibility and uh, hydraulic conductivity. So um, they're not really clean enough. Uh, they're, uh, they create, they have some fines in them. They can be gap graded, uh, variable gradations as well. Um, and can ex have excessive uh, coarse particles in them as, as well. So, you know, again, not meeting the criteria that we had just cable in the way. Um, so, again, that C33 fine aggregate, uh, which is, you know, again, concrete aggregate is, a, is excellent for almost all cases. Um, it's readily available. Again, it's used for, for concrete, except for that number 200 sieve uh, adjustment. And based on the 200 sieve, I mean, I've seen specifications that, that require 3% maximum in the stockpile and then allowing for 2% after compaction. So the maximum amount, oh, sorry, <laughs> don't have my, so, so the, uh, so typically you would allow 5%, I thought I had the lavalier on, so sorry. Um, <laughs> 5% uh, maximum compacted in place, but sometimes specifications require 3% maximum in the stockpile to allow that 2% 2, 2 increase based on the breakdown of fines when you compact it, because you're going to compact it with a smooth drum roll or adding water to it. So, um, so you want to limit that, but, you know, there's a lot of opinions about whether to include the 3% or just the 5%. The bottom line is we don't want more than 5% fines in it. So. I've also seen specs to just say, let the contractor figure out what it is in the stockpile. Our bottom line is what, what we want in place is what really controls. But I've seen it done both ways, and there's some pluses and minuses for, to, to do it both ways. So um, not suitable for some uh, clays and silts, like some category one. And I only know, at least in my career, there's only one, one project that was kind of unique that we actually had to use uh, masonry sand and probably multi uh, uh, layers of, of, of filters to maintain filter compatibility. So, okay, some of the some of the considerations for dimensioning of uh, of filter and drain zones. Certainly, permeability requirements come into play. Um, estimated maximum seepage flow, so they have to. And then my next slide goes through a, a little bit about that. Amanda touched on that, going through flow nets and then through uh, seepage models to determine what the flow is in order to size those dimensions properly for those filters and drains. Uh, constructability, construction equipment procedures. And, and constructability actually will be probably controlled more, more often than not. You could go through your seepage analysis, and this is fairly typical. You go through your seepage analysis, and I only need a two-foot wide filter based on that, um, uh, your seepage flows that you're expecting. But in reality, you can't build something two feet wide. So in most cases, it's going to be wider because you have to make it constructible. You're not going to make something that's really thin. And plus, you get contamination on both sides where you're placing the material. You imagine you're placing it next to core material. So you're going to get a little bit of migration of that right at that interface. That's you, you can't prevent that from happening. It may be just a couple of inches. So you don't want to make something really thin because it's even going to be thinner because of that uh, that little bit of interface between them anyway. So, And in high seismic zones, as we've already talked about, you could have uh, uh, the, the minimum widths and stuff will not be governed. You're going to be governed by how much offset that would be. This slide is, uh, it, you know, prov provides some of the um, requirements for the discharge capacity of a, a filter and drains. So it goes to the amount of flow that would be coming, your estimated flow coming out of either your flow net or more likely your, your seepage model uh, to determine 
uh, what the what the thickness of your blanket and what the uh, the width of your of your chimney needs to be, and uh, it really depends on the hydraulic conductivity of the material and of course um, at, you know uh, through your flow net models that we talked about before here. So you want to make sure that the drains are designed with uh, with adequate discharge capacity so you can lower the phreatic surface and you, you never want to have the phreatic surface go above that for your blanket, go above that drain zone. So you have to filter again your sand and then you have your stone above that. You never, you want to design it so that, that never goes up into your shell. You don't want to start saturating your shell. So that goes to your seepage model and, and your estimates of flow, of course, that are into that. In fact, uh, I know Cassie will talk about instrumentation later, but when I've been a lead engineer uh, on a similar project, I've put in posometers right above where that interface is with that drain stone is because I want to monitor if that ever got overwhelmed um, and find out kind of what's going on in there. And you can even put a basometer down in the drain stone as well if you wanted to or even in the filter. But you want to have an idea of, of how effective your chimney is uh, and your blanket. And, and since I have this slide up and it was kind of mentioned earlier, most of the flow is going to be coming through your foundation. You should not have a lot of flow going into your chimney. If you do, you either have a crack or you have a pervious layer, which can happen through your, through your embankment. For, for a new dam, uh, that's typically where a lot more of your flow is coming from, is, is uh, through your foundation instead. So, so um, Cedar again had some recommendations. Because of the wide range of permeabilities, because the permeability is the one parameter that, that ranges uh, by 10 orders of magnitude or so for, for uh, typical soil materials. So he suggested to, to increase your, your permeability. So that's what this is all about, is to estimate what kind of permeability you need for that filter and drain material. So once you go through that based on your model for, for amount of flow, um, that you, uh, you increase by 10 to 20 times um, that that permeability. So you can see there's an equation at the very bottom that indicates the, 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 the permeability, This and the C is for the chimney, and the B is just for the blanket. So the permeability of the chimney for the design, you use 20 times the permeability of your chimney from your seepage model. So 10 to 20 times, I just made it 20 times. But you know, you basically increase it in order of magnitude because of the uncertainty of, of exactly what your permeability is. Um, and this, I just want to mention at this point too, this assumes that you don't have any cracks in your embankment, right? We always talk about cracking of your embankment. So that's another added level of defense that you want to, that's another reason to put a drain material in because if you do get a crack in your embankment, you have that capacity to handle that kind of flow and not just a, a sand filter. So, so again, the 10 to 20 times increase doesn't really even account for having a crack in your embankment. So here's some suggested minimum dimensions of, of, of uh, chimneys and of blankets. And again, I wanna stress that these are absolute minimum values. It's gonna vary on your project. Uh, depending on your head, depending on the hydraulic conductivity of your core, uh, your seepage model, but uh, about five, maybe five to six feet for in the horizontal dimension for a sloping chimney, about a foot and a half for the blanket. And then for, uh, worked on one project, we actually used a, a three foot wide vertical chimney, uh, three to four foot wide and vertically, you're going to be uh, actually uh, using that as typically a trenching method. And I'm going to go over that in construction. That's a pretty thin chimney. Um, but then again, these are absolute minimum values. And then the, 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 the figure on the right is a cross section really for a modification. I'm talking more about new dams, but I wanted to throw this in there. Um, don't let this kind of just cartoon sort of figure fool you. You wouldn't excavate that much into an existing dam with, with some kind of head behind it, right? I've worked on a project where we basically stripped the topsoil off the downstream side, uh, lowered the pool, uh, and then constructed the filter on that shell material after the topsoil was stripped off, and then, and then uh, flattened the downstream slope. 
to then protect that filter. But I don't want this to fool you that you would go out and, of course, steepen your downstream slope like this with that kind of pool. So we may have to change that figure for a future class, but don't, don't, it's not to scale, put it that I should have put not to scale on here. So, so the benefits of having a, a full height chimney filter, uh, again, it protects uh, against uh, defects um, for higher pools. Um, and it lowers the phreatic surface so you don't have breakouts in your downstream slope. And, and of course, it increases the stability, your downstream slope stability um, as well. So, okay, so upper cross section shows a, a homogeneous, actually a zoned embankment with no chimney. And you have some sort of defect through your core. Now, whether that's a winter shutdown, uh, whether that is a improperly blended boral material that created some kind of defect through your core. In any event, you have some kind of defect that you could have a start an internal erosion issue. On the, on the lower slide, you put a filter on that downstream side. You now have a filtered exit, as we talked about before. Uh, and now you've protected that, that defect that is through your core. And, and a lot of times with existing dams, you may or may not even know there's a defect through the core. So always good to, another reason to put a filter. Now, now these, these figures actually were used uh, in Amanda's presentation on seepage, but I just wanted to point out um, that the, the hydraulic conductivity on the, on the figures on the left had increased as you're going down, right? So they're increasing in this direction, the horizontal um, uh, hydraulic conductivity, and then you have a tow drain and then a blanket, and that really wasn't effective in, in stopping the uh, flow to intersect your downstream slope, but you add a chimney drain, and you can see we started off at uh, uh, the hydraulic conductivity being horizontal being nine times that of the vertical, and you increase even that much more to 25 times and still maintain a dry downstream slope. So effectiveness of the chimney. So top elevation of the chimney filter, um, uh, the top should be at the, at the phreatic surface, um, historically, it's been at the phreatic surface or about at the normal pool. So it wasn't that many years ago, that was kind of the standard of design. And the thought process then was, well, shoot, during a storm event and during a flood, so something above that normal pool elevation, you're not going to saturate your whole core because it's only, the storm's only going to stay up there for 10 days or 30 days. And it's not enough time, as they call it, for that wetted front to go through your embankment to completely saturate it because it's a clay core. It takes longer than that. And then it comes back down. But what the flaw in that is that there is no crack associated with your embankment. So here we're designing the current practices go up to the maximum flood pool because if you do get a crack in your embankment, you've just protected that upper part. So that's the current practice. You know, I've been practicing long enough. We used to do the top part, but because of, of cracking, uh, potential of embankments, we now want to extend that, that chimney filter up higher. <laughs> Was that a strong hint, Brian? No. <laughs> so some of the, some of the Socrative, I didn't mention this earlier, um, some of the questions that we asked, you might see them later on, like maybe on Friday, just as a little hint, so, you know, but uh, keep that in mind. So again, the benefits of, of we always talk about two-stage filters uh, with that sand and then the stone um, right adjacent to it. It has a large capacity to, to handle uh, much larger flows. Again, if the filter cracks, you've got that drain stone, and, and that drain stone is extremely unlikely that would sustain a crack. So that's, that's another benefit of adding the drain stone. Um, and, uh, if you, if you do get a, a concentrated leak that overwhelms the capacity of that sand filter, again, you've got that drain stone right behind it to then be able to safely collect that material, that, that flow coming through. So I added this just to reemphasize that you won't see all the cross sections that have a, a filter here on the downstream side of your, of your chimney and then on your shell. And it really depends on the gradation of your downstream shell material. So typically, this would be, you know, a, a bit more pervious. It's certainly going to be, should be more pervious than your core, but it, it may or may not be required to do this. This is pretty standard, putting the filter in the drain stone, but it really depends 
on that gradation of a downstream shell. So just wanted to reemphasize that point. Now I have a, of a case that I just have a filter. I have a, a, a defect, again, through the core. Again, winter shutdown, uh, improperly a blended boral material, something that's going to trans, transmit uh, more seepage flows through that areas. So I may uh, induce an internal erosion failure mode. Uh, and the filter gets overwhelmed because there's too much flow into it. So you add that drain stone on the other side of it. And of course, the flow coming through the chimney filter that into the chimney drain will be translated into that blanket and transmitted safely downstream. So uh, tow drain systems, again, single stage and, and, uh, and, and two stage for the same reason we used to, not that many years ago, and, and I've been around long enough, we, we used to, I've, I've been involved with some, some designs that we used sand right up against the pipe, the perforated pipe. And if you do that, and if you look at filter compatibility criteria, you, you always had to have well screen pipe to be compatible with the sand. So the slots were somewhere on the order of a 64th of an inch wide. They're incredibly narrow slots to be filter compatible. So the current design standard, of course, is to use a two-stage system. Um, you, you surround, you, you put in your filter sand, you surround the pipe with your drain stone, um, and then you can open up the slots to about three eighths inch wide that way. So you have a lot more capacity to go into your, uh, so the, it goes much freely in more freely into your pipe and adding that much floor capacity um, to your whole system. So reclamation has some guidelines out there that uh, they use um, uh, you estimate the maximum flow through your seepage model, and then you size the pipe based on the pipe being only 50% full. That is their, their recommended standard. Now, if you have a pervious foundation that could have transmit a lot of flow, uh, they, they put that maximum flow depth in, your, in their pipes at one quarter of the diameter of the pipe. Um, and also, if they thought that they were putting it on a little bit more of a compressible foundation, they also will limit the maximum flow depth to a quarter as well, because you could get potentially sags in your pipe. I wanted to, to mention here about uh, th these, these drainage pipes are near, they're, they're called toe drains for a reason. They're obviously located near the toe. But I've, I've uh, worked on a risk assessment for a project that was built in the uh, mid-1920s that had a drain underneath the center line of the pipe in the foundation. So you couldn't almost get any deeper um, to be, so those are totally inaccessible. In fact, there was another project I didn't really get totally involved with, but I'm aware of that was built in like the 1980s that did the same thing. They put a put a tow drain at the, at the bottom underneath the center line of, of the dam in the foundation. So if anything happened to that pipe, you'd, almost, you'd have to breach the dam, lower the whole lake to get at it. You'd never want to do that in current design. I don't know how it happened in the 1980s, but may you understand, maybe the 1920s, but uh, don't ever do that. So here's, a, here's, a, here's one of the thin slotted pipes I was talking about earlier um, that, um, the, from the sort of speak the older days where you used to just do a, a single stage filter and um, um, I'd want to talk about a, a project I was involved with in Bankman Dam in Wyoming that um, that had some seepage issues and this is some years ago and uh, high phreatic surface a lot of seepage the downstream tow so an extensive seepage collection system was installed using this kind of method, single stage with thin slots in the pipe. And uh, sometime after the pool was filled back up, um, the piezometers indicated high, uh, high piezometric levels still, and there's still seepage issues along the toe of the embankment. So a remote operated camera survey was done. Uh, when, when, the, when the survey was conducted, it was found that the, that the water surface was above the top of the pipe, which is always a bad thing. Because that meant the, the pipe was restricting the flow. Um, and the sand grains actually got what was postulated, the sand grains got like ingrained in those narrow slots. 
And from the camera survey, you could see the water intermittently sort of spitting into the pipe. It wasn't free flowing in the pipe. So indicating that the grains of sand actually lodged in there and reduced the flow area. So that's why the two-stage filter at three H inch wide, filter compatible, you, you would get total uh, flow. So in that case, had to put in a whole nother seepage collection system, a two-stage system, and then the whole thing was drained down. So uh, two-stage filters are the, the, the standard practice and, and should always be used. So. so what about the perforation size or the slot size? Well, reclamation and, and the core uses the uh, D50 size of that stone that's a right around the pipe. And you use the fine band on that for D50. And that has to be, the D50 has to be larger than or greater than or equal to the maximum opening. And NRCS uses a slightly different criteria, but just to let you know um, how to size the slots of the pipe. Now, uh, Bureau of Reclamation did some studies back, they published this paper back in 2009. Uh, they did a, a very comprehensive evaluation of different types of, of drain pipes. Looked at HTP and PVC. PVC has been used historically for many years. Um, but what their determination was, uh, if anybody's worked on mine sites, um, the, 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 one, the pipe that they recommended because of the strength of it, the durability, um, um, and, um, and then the constructability as far as not failing it during installation was the solid wall HTPE that was butt fusion welded. Um, but they also had recommended the, the corrugated double walled or called profile pipe. So we had an external corrugations and the interior was smooth uh, for HDPE and, and also this well screen pipe, PVC pipe that is also much stronger than your kind of typical PVC pipe. So um, kind of keep that in mind. It's not sort of normal PVC pipe uh, uh, schedule 40 or 80 that is used anymore. So. Um, here is uh, going to talk a little bit about camera inspections. Um, there's numerous cases where, where uh, pipes have been damaged during construction. So I'm going to go back to this dam in Wyoming. Um, you know, some projects just seem to have uh, some issues that occur. Um, so sometime after construction was completed, there was manholes that were installed along the drainage system for, for, for inspection manholes and also to track flow coming from different areas out of the embankment. So um, the uh, dam operator had noticed there was something in the bottom of the manhole that looked like a piece of pipe. So he went down and retrieved it. Sure enough, there was a piece of broken PVC pipe that he brought to various people. So this seems a little unusual. So another camera inspection was done, brought the camera up into the pipe. Sure enough, the pipe had been crushed during the installation. So there was sand in the pipe. There was sand in the bottom of the manhole. Um, so, um, the, so what, what didn't happen was there was not an initial camera inspection when you have your first initial backfill over the top of that pipe. So usually we like to recommend two stages of doing an, a camera inspection um, for a drainage system. One again with a few feet over the top of the pipe and another at the end of final completion to make sure there's no defects in the pipe. Uh, that pipe that was buried about 20 feet deep, there were some tools that could be used remotely to kind of re replace that section, but um, that can be an issue. So just keep that in mind, if at all possible, I would put that requirement in specifications to do that. So, um, Drain cleanouts, I just want to talk about those for a second first. Uh, we recommend, that is, uh, the core typically recommends a minimum pipe diameter of eight inches. You don't want to go smaller than that. Part of the reason for that is you want to be able to clean out the pipe, and particularly you want to be able to uh, remote inspect it with a, with a video inspection, a, uh, a remote operated vehicle, ROV inspection. Also, part of that design, you, you want to have sweeping bends, and you don't want to have them uh, an angle greater than about 22 and a half degrees because again, that camera equipment can't really fit around a very well around a 45 degree bend. So, uh, and then that distance in between bends, uh, here it's showing a minimum of five feet, really kind of depends on the video equipment that you, you intend to use 
but it kind of a good rule of thumb to start with maybe five feet. You could get by with a little bit less than that potentially, but again, that's because of just the, the size, the length of, of video equipment that would be needed. So. Also, there's some recommendations on what the maximum pitch of a drain pipe would be in terms of accommodating um, uh, 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 video equipment. Kind of depends on the length, but the general rule of thumb is about five degrees. If it was steeper than five degrees and it's, it's dragging a cable along the way for the video equipment, it has so much friction on the pipe, it has a hard time being able to go up slope and drag that cable at the same time. So it varies on, on the length of the pipe, but as the length increases, that, that, that's where that, that five, uh, five degrees of, uh, of pitch of the pipe comes into play. Also, um, inspection wells or manholes, uh, typically about uh, 300 foot spacing, um, and that provides an access point uh, that you could actually put in seepage weirs in your manhole so you can isolate where the flow is coming from. Also, if you put a manhole in, you should have some sediment trap in there as well to detect if there's any uh, potential internal erosion failure mode that's occurring. You can tell by looking at the sediment and actually taking gradation of that as well. So, And you can put remote sensors so you wouldn't have to get down there with a staff gauge and, and read it. You can put in the uh, remote sensors to, to uh, uh, calculate the flow as well. You mentioned uh, uh, trench drains. Uh, usually they're, uh, they'd be slightly downstream of, of, uh, of like where a tow drain uh, would be placed, a uh, little bit downstream of the tow and, and, uh, uh, and deeper. And here, um, typically, if you had a, a backwards erosion piping, uh, potential failure mode, say in this pervious layer, um, you would extend that down to probably a more impervious layer uh, to prevent backward erosion piping. I, I, I mentioned that there's two core projects that are active right now that are in the design phase, uh, Proctor Dam in Texas and Whittier Narrows Dam, and they're both putting in deeper trench drains for that backward erosion piping failure. Otherwise, uh, you would have to open the entire excavation. You may have to go down, like Whittier Narrows, you'd have to go down about 15 to 20 feet uh, to open up a big excavation, which um, obviously there's failure modes associated with that and construction risks. So instead of doing that, uh, the narrower uh, trench drain method can be used. And depending on the depth you can put in, this can be a braced excavation. Uh, we're looking at, in Proctor Dam, the excavation is as deep as 30 feet. So we're looking, um, it hasn't been used, Reclamation's used it a couple times, a biopolymer, uh, which is a degradable type of slurry that you can put in to, to, uh, to maintain the stability of your wall. And then the biopolymer breaks down with time. You can't use a normal slurry because it would, it would block your seepage entrances. But with a, um, with a biopolymer, uh, again, it'll break down in time and then you'll be able to get flow uh, actually, Ed Friend that's coming in here, he's actually worked on a project that's a non-reclamation non -rec uh, or core dam in the private sector that he used this exact method. So it's been used on a rare occasion, but um, it's still, I think, an effective way to go. So I, I want to switch gears for a, a minute and talk about um, the fill placement adjacent to a pertinent structure. So here um, is against uh, spillway walls, both the placement, like I said, of... Uh, of uh, compacted fill and, um, uh, and, and filter material. Um, and then this is particularly right adjacent to the wall is a potential failure mode location where you could get a crack because it's a differential uh, movement right along that interface where you have uh, stiffnesses of different materials. So it's, it's prone to a crack right adjacent to the spillway wall. So special attention has to be made uh, to that interface uh, to make sure that you don't uh, create a crack. And, and one of those methods for a spillway wall, you know, here is the flow side. So it is a vertical face on the spillway wall. And then here's a battered face on the, on the fill side. And usually that's battered on a, on a pretty, um, fairly steep slope, like eight vertical to one horizontal. So at, if you get compression of your embankment, actually kind of gravity works with you and it actually compresses against that battered face, 
to basically effectively try to, to stop a crack from occurring there. Instead of having a vertical wall, which is harder to compact against, um, th that slightly tapered wall, and this is a pretty standard detail that's used today. For the, uh, for the section, so this is the plan view up in the left-hand corner with your spillway wall. Here is just a typical section that you've seen over and over again. Uh, and this is just a, a plan view cut uh, a little bit deeper um, uh, uh, you know, through, through the center line. Um, but th uh, this shows a spillway wall in plan. Uh, here's the core, upstream side, downstream side. And the standard detail is to slightly thicken the, the uh, chimney filter right adjacent to the wall because if you get a crack along that interface, um, uh, you, you have an additional protection of your filter right there. Now, I wanna talk just very briefly about filters around outlet. Uh, Brian Dillard in his case history mentioned this. Uh, FEMA has some guidelines on dimensions to put for filter collars around uh, outlets. And uh, anti-seep collars that used to be used in the day, if you kind of blow this up, there's, uh, there's concrete collars that are, um, that are around outlet works that are no longer used. They, it was hard to compact against them. You get uh, um, low density zones and they actually have uh, contributed, we think, to, uh, to failures. So you would never design a concrete collar around your outlet works uh, today. And then placement of fill adjacent to conduit. So the figure on the left, if you had shallow rock, you're building a new embankment, you try to excavate into that rock, place concrete around your conduit up to the top of rock. That's a pretty standard detail. If you had a, a soil foundation, you'd wanna excavate around your conduit wide enough that you could get bigger compaction equipment uh, about, you know, say three to five feet away and then smaller equipment adjacent to your conduit. And you also notice that these slopes are also the, uh, the conduit, um, uh, backfill concrete used around the conduits are also sloped. And this shows 10 vertical to one horizontal again to basically uh, be able to compact against that and to reduce the cracking potential um, around that conduit. So, um, Am I doing on time here? Am I? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> um, just want to touch on coffer dams. Coffer dams are used, uh, uh, obviously, quite extensively, particularly on new dam construction. Um, they require uh, same risk considerations as a new dam because they are the, the, uh, the surface that replaces a new dam. Um, that coffer dam replaces the dam. It's going to pond water behind it. So you really have to design it as if it's a permanent dam. Uh, so uh, the risk of that has to be considered. Um, and then what the consequences of failures are. Um, and the, uh, um, and the trade-offs associated with that, uh, the risk and the, and the costs associated with it. So I think just for the for, for time here, Renee, I think I'll just kind of press press forward. So the, 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 I just wanted to ask one question of the group. Um, if you had a coffer dam that had life safety implications if it failed, um, and, and according to core criteria, who who should design the coffer dam? Should it be left to the contractor or should it be the designer? Anybody particularly from the core know the answer to that? So, Should be the designer. Should be the designer. <laughs> exactly right. So, uh, and what's the reason for that? Well, the liability of the design should completely come on, on the owner and, uh, and the designer and the core in this case, because it is a, is a temporary surface that serves as the main impoundment uh, for the for the, um, uh, during that short period of time you're in construction and there's life safety implications if it fails. So some construction considerations that were just included in a recent project that I was involved with, the time of year the coffer dam was built, um, the timing on this particular project, you, you wanted to build the coffer dam, do, do work associated with that if possible, and then take the coffer dam out during the drier season, so during a non-flood time or reduced flood time, 
So you, you have a less potential to overtop the coffer dam. There's also some triggering elevations that should be put in the contract requirements um, as that pool rises to have the contractor take certain actions. And then a liability statement in there about who's responsible for damages if that coffer dam gets overtopped. Um, and that, you know, you want to share the liability with the contractor. We don't want to put it all on the contractor. It's going to be just reflected in the bids. That's not really fair. So simple case history, diversion, I'm going to switch to. Uh, this is non-core dam that was built some years ago. Um, just wanted to point out there's a, here's a new embankment yet to be constructed here. They put a, a, a coffer dam in, or they called it a dike, put in a diversion tunnel, diverted flows through there, and they actually used this uh, for water supply pipes uh, after the construction was over. So the tunnels have been used quite extensively for new dam construction. Here's a dam in, in South America that actually the RMC was, got involved with. Um, it's a new embankment dam that is uh, almost 740 feet high, hydropower project, a large project that they used, uh, again, tunnels and a, um, and a coffer dam to divert flows, some uh, high flows during construction. I'm gonna just take about two minutes to go through overtopping protection, um, just very quick. I'm not sure if anybody's worked on any overtopping protection project, but Whittier Narrows Dam being designed by the Corps uh, is gonna um, consider, is gonna install a overtopping protection on existing embankment. Uh, usually it's some kind of hardened material like roller compacted concrete or soil cement. Uh, not recommended for new dams because, you, again, you can get post-construction settlement and cracking of that overtopping protection. And there's a lot of issues, design considerations to go through um, that I don't think I'm going to cover in detail here. It is used, but if you ever get involved with it, it you just have to kind of go into the details. And there is... There is um, a special publications. FEMA has one, uh, P1015, that is specifically related to overtopping protection of existing dams. I just wanted to show you a typical cross-section. Typically, you would put some kind of cutoff wall near the upstream side. The flow would come over here. Um, you'd overtop protect your embankment crest as well as the downstream slope. You put filters underneath for uplift pressures that could uh, be required. You put a cutoff wall at the downstream end. Um, and your hydraulic jump should occur within this protected area. You don't want your hydraulic jump to be protected, to be uh, occur downstream of that because you could start uh, at a, a failure mode if that was to occur. Embankment, the uh, seismic features, I think uh, Amanda's going to cover that in a bit more detail, but the general rule of thumb, I want to point out just one thing, the, the width of the filters, um, you typically, uh, just from precedence and experience, you make them twice as, as wide as what the expected offset would be. So Isabella, they actually measured the offset to be about six and a half feet from trenching. They saw that in, in, in trenches, and they made uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the offsets, the, 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 um, the actual thicknesses to be like they rounded it up to 15 feet in areas. So to make sure when it offsets, again, there still had filter compatibility. 